My name is Christina Kolb and I'm the director of MARSH. We are a chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, as uh, Tara was talking about, and we're focused on the Marvin area of uh, Union County, which is uh, 28173 zip code is kind of how we uh, focus ourselves. Our mission is to engage our community and educate them about the benefits of restoring and protecting wildlife habitats. We have a lot of new construction in this part of Union County, so you can imagine we are destroying a lot of wildlife habitats. So it, it's very, very important for us to get the word out. If you are a member of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation or become one in the future, you can select Marsh as your donor chapter affiliation and our group will get part of your membership fee. And that allows us to do presentations like the one we're doing tonight. Uh, we do, um, gosh, I can't, I, I set them all up and now I can't remember how many there are, but we do them uh, several, I think it's five or six of them. So we've got them going on um, several months out of the year. Um, before I introduce tonight's guest though, I wanna remind you about next month's speaker and the topic. On March the 23rd at 6.30 p.m., same kind of setup, uh, Carol Bowie Jackson will meet us on Zoom to discuss bringing birds to your yard. Um, apparently, it doesn't really take a lot because I'm looking at about 4 billion of them at, during the day outside of my window over here, but she can be very specific about what food and types of feeders will bring in what types of birds and what types of plants you can plant to actually do it naturally instead of uh, with all these bags of food that I have around my house. Uh, she is the owner of Wildology and a well-known bird expert. We'll have, be sharing registration information for, uh, about that in a week or so. Tonight's presentation is gonna be a little bit broader though. Uh, Debbie Foster is with us to discuss how to create a wildlife habitat in our landscape and why that's important. So not just focusing on birds because there's a lot of other creatures living in my yard anyway and yours too, you may not have seen them all, but they're there. Uh, Debbie has an extensive background in what I'm gonna call nature studies. I don't know what you call it, Debbie, but after I read your resume, <laughs> that's all I could come up with for that. Um, she is a habitat steward, a habitat host, and a habitat ambassador for the National Wildlife Federation, and a founding member of the first local chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation called HAWK, which stands for Habitat and Wildlife Keepers, it's in Matthews, North Carolina, right? Um, which is very close to where we are. Uh, she is a Central Carolina's master naturalist and an Audubon ambassador. And she's also completed her certification uh, in native plant studies at UNCC, which is a hundred hours of uh, study at, a, uh, at the university uh, in the botanical gardens area. And that's a really fascinating program that's just you know up the road. Um, her uh, helping people create wildlife habitats is her passion, and she's going to share that with us tonight. Um, please use the chat box to uh, add your questions, and we'll cover those at the end of the presentation. And we will also announce the winner of a bird bath heater just before the Q&A section. And make sure that you mute your line during the presentation, and we will get started. I will hand it to you. I'm up for muted enough. I will do it for you. Okay, so it says host disabled participant screen sharing. And I am going to fix that for you. Thank you. <laughs> Watch me panic. No, don't panic, don't do that. Now see if that works. I should have done that before. Did that work now? There we go. Okay. I just have to find it now. Here we go. Okay, can you all see that? Hey, honey. Hey, I see, uh, it looks like a, a bunch of file um, files. You don't see a picture with wildlife on it? Not yet. No. I think you might need to share again. Okay. It's in a chatting, you guys should have had this up ahead of time. There we go. So I forgot I had a Zoom meeting at 6.30 uh -huh. for how to make a certified wildlife habitat. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, we're going to all mute your line. That would be <laughs> all of us. Thank you. 
I'm trying to do it for you. Uh oh. All right, why is it going forward? I'm pushing backwards. Let's just see here. Okay, so this is on certified wildlife habitats and, and it's not certified bird habitats as, as Christina mentioned, because you can create any kind of a wildlife habitat. But I will tell you, when you start the presentation with telling people you can create a, a habitat for snakes in your yard, it's a pretty hard sell. So um, birds are a good thing to attract to your yard because they're kind of in the middle of the whole hierarchy there. So if you have birds, you're going to have some things that prey on birds and you're going to have some things that birds prey on. So it, it's a, a nice thing to try. And what I've done here is just take a series of pictures in, in my yard. Um, there's only one picture that didn't come from my yard, just randomly throughout the years. On the top left, that is our native honeysuckle. And I don't know why anybody would want Japanese honeysuckle if they could have that coral honeysuckle instead. The silly plant blooms year round. It's not supposed to here, but it does in more than one location that I'm personally aware of. And it is a hummingbird magnet. So that's a really wonderful, beautiful plant to have in your yard. You can frequently get those at the UNCC plant sale. And I think I saw it at Winghaven for their plant sale as well. Lisa Tompkins of Carolina Heritage Nursery would have um, all these plants as well. And then the little one in the middle is a Fothergilla plant, and that is a beautiful little um, small bush um, that I love to have in my yard. On the far right on the top, we have parsley. And most people don't know, parsley is not native, um, but parsley, fennel, and dill are excellent uh, host plants for different types of caterpillars. So I always make sure I have plenty of parsley. That way, if I want to eat some, I've got some left over and uh, let the butterflies have the rest of it or the larva of the butterflies. That's the black swallowtail larva there. And then in the middle on the left, we can see bee balm, the, the red, bright red uh, plant. That is, um, I think it's called technically a self-seeding biennial, but it again is a hummingbird magnet. So I love to have that around in, in gardens that I create. Then in the middle, um, on the middle row, we had a visitor one day that my husband called to tell me somebody was at the front door for me and I went out and found this black rat snake there. I was happy to see the black rat snake. I didn't step on him because I saw him. So that was one really good thing. But also these are beneficial snakes to have in your yard. So I, I welcome them. I don't have any problem with having non-venomous snakes in my yard. And the cheeky guy in the middle on the right is a red-shouldered hawk who is actually sitting on top of my bird feeder system. So I thought that was pretty brazen of him. He's out there frequently because I hear my parrot yelling at him. So uh, <laughs> he likes to hang out. And then the little guy on the bottom left, a, a squirrel apparently getting really comfortable. The one in the middle is the only thing that didn't come out of my yard, but this came out of the campus in uh, at CPCC Levine, and it was um, right off the parking lot. It's a kill deer, and I stumbled just by accident, saw the birds, started kind of hunting for the nest, and nest is a misnomer because they lay the eggs right on the ground, and they look a lot like gravel. Um, if you approach the nest, the parent will start trying to half fly, half run away, trailing a wing and vocalizing, and it says its name, kill deer, kill deer, very loudly trying to draw a predator away from the nest. So it's a fascinating behavior to watch. And then on the bottom right, that's a flock of cedar wax wings. I probably lived here, oh, I don't know, 15 years before I ever saw the first one, and they've been back every year since then. And you can see they're quite enjoying the bird bath. So this whole wildlife uh, program started back in 1973, and I usually contact one of my, my cronies at NWF periodically to find out where we are. So we are over 228,000 in the country now. And North Carolina is, I think, may have the largest number at 10,000. Charlotte has over 1,300, and Matthews has over 300. So when you um, start uh, working toward getting Marvin certified as a community wildlife habitat, you'll be keeping statistics like this. And I can tell you, it's a lot of fun and very reinforcing to watch those numbers grow. And then this is a list, and it may be a partial list at this point, 
of the certified community wildlife habitats in the state of North Carolina. And you can see we have quite a few of them. And this is a mark of pride, I think, for North Carolinians because it definitely shows that we have some common values across our state. So I really like to see this. Um, and I have pointed it out to politicians more than once um, because I do think it shows some common values that they need to be aware of. So David, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. Marvin is actually a certified community now. Oh, it is certified. Well, congratulations. Thank I will you. add that to my list. Thank you. I went on NWF this afternoon and couldn't find the list. So I, I didn't think that you were certified, but bravo. Well done. So I put this slide in several years ago because I was at a meeting doing this type of presentation and a fairly grumpy guy raised his hand to ask a question. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, why should I care? And I was dumbfounded. I literally sat there with my mouth hanging open for a while and finally started to give him some information, but I got the impression we didn't really connect on a deeper level. But it, it did start me thinking along the lines of, okay, well, why should we care? Well, Charlotte lost 41 acres a day to construction for years and years and years. And it doesn't take a math whiz to know that that's not sustainable. From 1985 to 2008, Charlotte lost 49% of its tree canopy. And I think I saw a figure as low as 45% remaining tree canopy recently. I know that they have a plan um, to bring it back up, but I also read that that plan doesn't look like it's going to be able to meet the mark that they've set. Um, so what, why do was, what difference does it make? Why should we care for losing all these trees? Well, we're going to be having floods because the trees absorb the water and so stormwater runoff is going to be affected. Trees remove pollutants from the air, so we are now not breathing as healthy in air quality because of this loss. Um, it affects the air quality. We have kids that suffer from something that Richard Louv termed nature deficit disorder. And I want you to think back to when you were in elementary school. How many kids did you see that we might have labeled ADHD at that point in time? You know, I know I'm the oldest of six kids and my mother would say, get out. And I have friends go, oh yes. And I was always threatened this. You better be back in at, at uh, dark. And I said, yeah, mom, mom didn't say that. <laughs> We played outside all the time. Um, we know that our wildlife is losing habitat. Look at the butterfly population. The monarch butterfly population has been decimated. There's a report called Surviving by Degrees that Audubon published, and it talks about how many of our bird species are at risk. And they think that probably some of them can't be saved at this point, but we can work toward that goal no matter what. Food chain's broken at many levels. We have coyotes running amok in every county in North Carolina now. They don't have a natural predator anymore. So that food chain has, has collapsed on itself. And then wildlife and humans intersect. We, we hit wildlife a lot, deer, um, coyotes, fox, okay, all of the, even skunks, okay. Um, we're, we're sharing habitat now and not always for the comfort of the humans or the benefit of the wildlife. So the bottom line is it's costing us a lot of money. It's costing us environmental um, concerns, health to our, our plants and our animals. And we're looking at cost right now and big costs moving into the future. And those costs are just too high. So if we can do one little thing as an individual or as a group like you guys, then that's, that's a good step to take. We may not be able to change the overall political structure or affect national policy, but we can do things locally and that's where we're going here. Um, so the first question is, well, where can we create wildlife habitats? And the short answer is anywhere, it doesn't matter. You can create one on an apartment balcony or on a patio home, um, it, you know, it doesn't matter. Any place, places of worship, businesses, schools, and those are all um, the NWF certifications, and then North Carolina Wildlife Federation added some special designations too. The faith habitat is for places of worship, island habitat, obviously islands in our, our lakes that we have in the area. Um, weight is a business certification, and then wildlife friendly development is an interesting concept where before 
anything is ever done to the land, people go out and do a complete assessment looking at the plants and the animals and the wildlife that are on that property and figuring out how best to develop that property without causing a lot of damage there. It doesn't matter what the location is, the requirements of all wildlife habitats are exactly the same. And those are very simply food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable gardening practices. And we're gonna walk our way through each of those and I'll give you an example of, of what they might be. So I think before we jump in and start um, just planning a wildlife habitat, we have to analyze it from a certain perspective. So I tell people, go out and take inventory. What do you have in your yard, okay? Do you have trees, shrubs, grass, ground cover? I would be willing to bet everybody has at least one of those, maybe two or three in your yard. Um, do you have something with nectar, seeds, berries, or nuts? Again, it would be hard not to have at least one of those things. What colors and shapes and sizes do you have with things that bloom in your yard and produce fruits in your yard? And a big question, what is it you want? Are you trying to attract birds? Are you trying to attract snakes? Are you trying to attract butterflies? You know, because we can almost surgically put in the requirements for each of those things if we think about it from their perspective and food, water, shelter, places to raise young um, as we're doing it. Big question you really need to ask is, is there anything you don't want? I got into this originally by going to a local bird store and said, I would like to put in a bird feeder, but I do not want to feed squirrels because they had gotten into my house in Georgia. And let me tell you, they really like living inside. So it was very difficult to get them out. They darn near burned my house down because they were chewing wires against exposed wood. So I did not want squirrels. So um, he said, well, let, let's start feeding cardinals. I'm like, okay, I like cardinals. What do we feed cardinals? He said, well, if we feed them safflower seed, that's something that cardinals prefer, but squirrels as a rule don't like it. So I said, sign me up. And then I went back when it was such a success and said, okay, I wanna attract something else. He said, how about goldfinches? And I said, oh, I don't have any goldfinches in my yard. And he said, well, it's because you don't have the food for them. If we provide the food, they'll come. And by George, he was right. And then I had a yard full of goldfinches. So I just kept adding layer after layer after layer. And at that point in time, we didn't have a lot of information on native plants. So I was doing this all by providing specific types of bird seed and specific types of feeders. Now we've got a lot of information on native plants and we can do this a little bit differently. Um, so we can ask, is, is the food going to be something that is naturally occurring in your landscape, like a bush that has a pollen or nectar or blueberries, that's a good example, or is it going to be something that's man provided like a bird feeder with seed, okay? Both of those are equally valid, but one might be easier long-term, one might be less of a budgetary concern, one will certainly be less labor involved over the years. So we can make those decisions and think about it. And we would do that by thinking about where we have available to place feeders or tree shrubs or bushes, um, how much money we have to spend on that. Where is this um, going to be? So one of the things that we learned the hard way is if you put a wildlife habitat at a school, well, generally speaking, people aren't there in the summer. And do schools have the budget to provide for seeds and feeders, for example? Do they have teachers or parents that they can spend their time cleaning these things and, and filling these things. And that, that can be a hard sell. If you go with a natural solution to that, you don't have that to worry about. So this is an example of blanket flower or giardia. Um, and there's a, looks like a honeybee on that. And then there's everybody's favorite squirrel. <laughs> So feeders versus plants. Feeders have to be specific. There's not a one size fit all. And Carol's going to talk about this a lot. So I'm just going to rip through this. You do have to refill them. And let me tell you, they're eating very heavily because we've had some cold and rainy weather. And so they're really hitting the feeders right now. They have to be cleaned, which is not, not my favorite chore to do. I will tell you they're creating feeders that are much easier to clean now. So they're kind of re reinventing the wheel there. 
Um, sometimes you have to replace them, although there are feeders now with lifetime guarantees. So that's an awesome thing. Um, I had a feeder disappear. It took me a solid year to find it, and a raccoon had apparently taken it off the feeder system, which had a baffle on it, by the way, walked across the yard with it, and climbed into the hammock to eat the suet that was in there. Didn't see that one coming. And they can be expensive, but I'll tell you, too, this you get what you pay for with these. You're far better spending a little bit more money for a better-made feeder, especially if it's got a lifetime warranty. Now, if you go with the plant thing, you can have a lot of different things that are provided by the plants in this. So just as beginning of the list right there, it's not a comprehensive list. They can be part of your landscape, too. So you get the joy of seeing the color, the texture, um, the seasonal changes in these plants that are part of your landscape and provide food for wildlife. They can affect your shade and then affect your utility bill. So finding out which side of your house to plant a tree on is really valuable. And they can certainly provide a cover and places to raise young as part of the requirements. And they can feed you too. If you get blueberries, you can get blueberries now that bloom in different seasons. They won't bloom in the dead of winter, but they'll bloom early spring, early summer, and late summer. So you kind of have this really nice um, continuum of blueberries that are available to you and to the critters in your yard. I've got a dog wrestling with a toy um, behind here that you can't see. So if you're wondering what the heck that is, that, that's it. <laughs> Okay, I did want to hit the highlights on some native plants. Um, the first one is Black Eyed Susan, and that is what is pictured in this um, photo. And if you look really carefully, there's a goldfinch right there in the middle of it. So I call this the workforce of the garden because this Rudbeckia will bloom from early, early in the spring to late, late, late in the fall. And the magical thing about this, because nature's just magical, is the seed heads on this Rebecca, all those little, those little um, circular dark spots, dark brown spots, they ripen at the exact same time that goldfinches come off the nest. And goldfinches are one of the few, if not the only, um, well, one of the few uh, birds that don't feed their babies insects, they feed their baby seed. And so the seed becomes available to them when the goldfinches are ready to feed their young. I think that's just wonderful. It's also a good reason why you would not be going and deadheading these things because you want to leave them accessible to the birds. This is a church wildlife garden here and I have come in at 7, 7.30 during the summer to work in this garden. And there might be three dozen goldfinches here. And when you come up, they just all soar up into the sky at the same time. It is absolutely beautiful. And then the second plant is called cardinal flower. And that is not a long lived plant, but it is a very high value plant. Um, and I plant it for um, hummingbirds as well. It frequently grows in wetter areas. So you can see this in the wild along creek banks. And um, I generally have to replace this every two or three years. Sometimes it will self-seed for a little bit longer than that, but it's simply not a long-lived plant, or at least not in the landscape industry. And then coral honeysuckle, which you saw in the opening screen. Purple coneflower, most people probably know about, and that, like this Rudbeckia, forms those wonderful seed heads that are so beneficial to, um, to birds. Um, I've also seen praying mantis lay their, their um, egg sacs on purple cone flower and rudbeckia. And so sometimes at the very end of the gardening season, we'll start to find these scattered throughout. Blueberries are great, parsley, fennel, and dill, even though it's not native, none of those are native, but they are also not invasive. And that's become my, my barometer. When I start looking at things to put in my yard, I will ask, is it native? So that's my first goal. But if it's not, then I'll say, okay, well, is it invasive? And if the answer is yes to that, I don't put it in my yard anymore. I used to. That's just a change that I've made over the years as I've done this. And then milkweed. If we want monarchs, we need milkweed. And usually it's going to require common milkweed and butterfly weed. Um, so you have to find sources for those. And the, the sources that I cited earlier would be good for those as well.
So you have to plan for this. I was so guilty of going to one of the big box stores and seeing something that was so pretty and I brought it home and I didn't read the tag at all and it didn't live because I put a plant that needed dry conditions in a wet spot or vice versa. I put a plant that needed full sun in one of the shade gardens. So um, we've got to understand the plants have their own rules to follow. And we, if we follow those rules along with them, we're going to have a much more successful garden um, for all of our wildlife. So look at the water requirements, look at the light needs. Um, and, and backing up one second there, Dr. Malachamp, who was the director of the gardens and, and greenhouses at UNCC for 38 years, said, if you see a tag that says full sun on it, it doesn't really mean full sun in the South, that most of our plants need a couple of hours protection from the sun in the full afternoon sun. So that explained to me why I could never keep geraniums going because it said full sun and I thought I was doing something right. But the full sun on the deck um, in the afternoon was wicked and they, they simply didn't thrive there. What kind of soil do you have? Now, the beautiful thing about native plants is they grow in our native soils. So we can cuss our clay soil all day long, but that is our native soil. Now, if it's as hard as a rock or a brick, then yes, you may have to break it up and add some soil amendment to it. But if you are able to break it up so that you can plant something in it, it's probably fine as is. And then maintenance, that's what everybody wants to think about, maintenance. I have all these people at church going, when are you gonna cut those down? And I say, I'm not, because if you have a wildlife habitat, you don't do maintenance like you used to, okay? Because again, those seed heads are ripening, for example, and we wanna leave them for access with those birds. So we don't do deadheading, okay? If, if I have something that's really special at my church wildlife habitat and I want a second bloom, I'll leave the bulk of the spent blooms and I will just cut back a small portion to have a rebloom there, but I almost never do that. And then somebody had asked this question earlier. So Christina went ahead and forwarded it to me so I could talk about it. Um, again, what we used to do was come fall when the leaves started coming down, we ran out there with rakes and we rake, raked and we raked and we bagged our leaves and we bagged our cut spent blossoms and we took them to the curb, right? Not so in a wildlife habitat because as you're removing things like um, stems and, and blooms, you don't know what has, has laid its eggs in there. So you are removing things that are beneficial to your wildlife habitat that you may not even be aware of are, are there. So you just leave those alone and let them, let them go through the winter. And I think I saw, uh, I'm pretty sure it was North Carolina Native Plant Society give a date in March that they recommended, but everything that I was looking at um, said basically spring. So you can define whatever spring is this year, who knows, right? <laughs> but wait until then to start moving things out. So we don't wanna be fighting mother nature to try and get plants to survive because it's just, we're gonna be losing there and we're gonna be wasting a lot of money that we could have spent on other stuff. So it's not nice to fool mother nature. So we'll move on to water. And, you know, this is the first thing that all living beings need. Humans can live longer without water than without food, right? So we can provide water any way we want to or every way we want to. I've got a lot of water features in my yard. So I've got bird baths, but I've got bird baths that are high bird baths and bird baths that sit on the ground because not everything bathes up high. And I can put them on the ground and a turtle might access it. I've also got a small pond. Um, and, and we started out with a smaller pond and realized quickly that there were a lot of benefits to having a pond. Uh, we saw dragonflies in our yard the day after the first pond went in, which was amazing. We'd never seen those before, but we didn't have the habitat before. Now we always have dragonflies in the backyard. Uh, if you've got streams or lakes or even wet swampy areas that are not, they don't have to be wet year round, but just a low area that tends to stay wet for part of the year, that would technically qualify. Mm -hmm. Take the bottom to a plant, the reservoir that comes on the bottom of a planter, and you can fill that with water and put it up on a deck rail. You can put it on a stump that's been cut. You can put it on the ground. And then I, I showed you some of my favorite things in here. So this weird looking contraption there, 
um, the curved area, that is a dripper mister. And you can get them as just drippers or just misters, but I got the combined one. And you can see it clips right onto the side of the side of the bird bath. And what I will do is I will set that to a very slow drip. So you can set it for how fast it drips or how big it sprays, okay? And so I will set it for a slow drip because that's going to keep the water agitating a little bit, which deters mosquitoes from laying their eggs in it. So that's one benefit. If I set it to a spray, I will see some birds will come and sit in the spray on the edge and hummingbirds will fly back and forth through the spray. So I consider this to be one of the best accessories you can get for your bird baths. And then this other weird thing that's got a rock sitting on it. Um, is actually a heater. So it's um, thermostat. It doesn't just go all the time. It's got a built-in thermostat and it will only come on uh, when it's below freezing. Because you know, we've got to keep water liquid if birds want to drink it. So uh, this is a, a wonderful thing too and it's only out there part of the year. And I'll tell you too, you can see this bird bath is a really old concrete bird bath. And they used to make these, got these types of bird baths deep well, they were too deep for some of our birds. So I always don't fill it up all the way and I will put rocks in it so that the birds have a perching place in addition to the edge of the, the um, bird bath itself. So we have to have water year round, which means when it's really wickedly cold outside, if we get a lot of snow, if we have a lot of days below freezing, we need to go out there and if we're not gonna use some type of heater, go out there and dump out the ice and refill it because it is used for dr more than drinking, but it's required for drinking, it's also used to keep their feathers in good shape. So they will bathe year round and keeping those feathers in tip top condition helps them evade predators. They're a more efficient flyer if the feathers are in good shape. Now, some people don't wanna have a bird bath because of mosquitoes. And you just have to understand a little bit about mosquitoes and then that's just not a, a big problem. Um, so one, if you have a lot of birds in your yard, you're probably not going to have a lot of mosquitoes because mosquitoes are dinner and lunch and breakfast and snacks. So that's not a bad thing. Um, but you, you understand the life cycle of mosquitoes. If you understand that they only lay their eggs in stagnant, still water, then you can start to change up what you're doing in your, your yard. You can change your bird bath more frequently so that you interrupt that breeding cycle. Um, there are some commercial products that you can use as well. There's something called a water wiggler, and it kind of looks like a spaceship on legs. And the what it does is it's got a little wheel in it, and that wheel just spins, and it just agitates the water a little bit, which discourages the mosquitoes from laying in that water. Um, it's battery operated. Uh, I, I had one that lasted for years and years and years and years. So I don't worry about mosquitoes so much in my yard because I've got other methods of controlling them. I don't need to be spraying. And if you've heard some of the advertising campaigns for the, the companies that spray for mosquitoes, they say that they only kill mosquitoes. That is absolutely not true. So don't, don't buy into that one. And then cover, and cover is a place for something to escape predators, a place to dash into. Can also be a place to raise babies, but um, we've got this wonderful uh, marble salamander and you can see he's in a fairly wet area. I don't remember the name of that plant right now. Our snakes and leaf litter, okay? These little guys, brown-headed nut hatches, will um, go into a cavity in a tree. I had a dead dogwood in my yard and I got to watch two of these excavating a cavity, lay eggs, raise four babies. And it was, it was high entertainment for me um, most of the summer. It was absolutely awesome to watch. And then this tree that has been dead for years finally fell down right after that. So I didn't get to watch them. I won't get to watch them this year. And then um, frogs and um, owls. You can put up an owl box. Um, it may take a while to get it and do your research to make sure you know how high up it needs to be and how big it needs to be and what else you need to do. Um, one of my friends along the Greenway, Matthews, it took him eight years to get owls in his owl box, but he's had them for the last three years now. And then it's also about perspective. I used to think if you only think birds, you're not thinking perspective. Craig Wyant, who was an awesome man who died, I think last year, 
taught me about this. He would literally get on his belly on the ground to see what the vantage point was from there. And he'd stand on his knees and he'd look again and he'd stand up and he'd look again. And you can appreciate that you would see different things from different perspectives. And that gives you a different way of looking at the possibility of creating a wildlife habitat and showing you too what you might need to do to pull different um, living beings in there. So we've got a luna moth, we've got a worm snake. This is a chrysalis from the monarch butterflies, which I found this summer and I was overjoyed. And then we've got a mockingbird hanging out somewhere in my yard. So cover can be trees, shrubs, bushes, plants, rocks, brush piles. Those are things, the rocks and the brush piles people don't think about. And then man-made, we do have houses like bird, bat, butterfly, um, and toad abodes. Those are a great place for toads to go out and keep from drying out and get out of the sun, um, evade predators. Um, but I think it's so cool to think about the idea of a brush pile. So here's an example that I found on um, the internet. We just take the stuff we would have put at the street and we start creating a pile in the corner of our yard and we leave it alone. And you will see little birds that hang out in it. Sometimes you'll see something hunting in it too, um, but it's a really beneficial habitat and it's free, right? Just pick up your sticks and throw them in a pile, win-win. And then places to raise young, because you know what? Some things will um, go to birdhouses and some things will never, ever lay their eggs in a birdhouse. I was at Reedy Creek for the Hummingbird Festival. I'm usually a speaker there. And there was a company that was selling um, hummingbird houses. And people were saying, oh, will they lay their eggs in this? And they were going, yes, they will. <laughs> no, they won't, okay? So it does help to know. So some, some things like robins, you're not gonna see a robin use a house. They're always gonna go to some shrub. Um, and then others, others have to have a certain size opening, a certain size house that has to be put in a particular um, height or direction. So again, you have to do a little bit of research in order to guarantee your, your um, results. And then I like to tell people to put up baffles. Carol will probably talk about that. But the point of these baffles is to keep predators from shimmying up the pole and accessing the nest or the nesting site, the house. Um, so ra raccoons, for example, cats, black snakes, um, if they can get to the adults or in some cases the eggs or the babies, they will predate on them. We can't help our birds once they hit the ground, but we can get them to that point. Give some protection from the el elements and think about real estate. They always say it's location, 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 right? It's the same for birds. So we have to be thinking about having cover to the back so that they can dart into cover. Um, we have different heights cover because some things will go to the ground to hide, some will go into trees or shrubs, and those are going to be different heights. So we want to think about that before we put in a house and then go, I've never had birds in that house. Well, there's a reason for that. So if you find out what you're trying to attract and what their needs are, then you're probably going to be able to relocate that house and have success. And then the common sense approach is what I call it. It's interesting to me because MWF had this in for years and then they took it out because they thought it might be too much of a hardship for people. And then they put it back in. So to me, it makes sense because if you spend your time and your money and put the emotional investment into drawing all this wildlife into your yard, you wanna see the hummingbirds, you wanna see the monarch butterflies, you wanna see different types of our native bees, and you do something that kills all those things, that just doesn't make sense, right? So um, be very, very thoughtful about your chemical use. I'm not saying don't use it because that's usually not acceptable to people. So what I am saying is be surgically precise if you plan to use it. Use the least um, aggressive method possible, okay? Pick a very still day instead of a, a windy day. And instead of broadcast spraying something like Roundup, Roundup um, cut the stems, put Roundup in a sponge applicator and within about 15 seconds of cutting those stems toward the ground, dab it um, there. Now, I still don't use it in my yard because that's just a, a choice that I have made years ago. 
Uh, I don't want to be around it and I don't want to have to worry about it. I don't want to worry about how long it lasts in the soil, for example, or how many different types of wildlife it affects. So I just made that choice. But um, again, you can make your own choice. Just, you know, check into some of these things. If you spray around a, a pond or a bird bath, you're contaminating the water source for these animals too. So you can contaminate their food, their water, their cover, the places to raise young, and that kind of defeats the purpose of trying to draw them in. Do be very careful about the source of your plants. There's been something that's been used for a while now called neonicotinoids, and the research um, is showing that these um, are certainly harmful to our bees. And if we like to eat, then we need to protect bees. So um, I think Lowe's started a campaign within the last probably two years saying they were no longer using them on their, their plants that they get. So that's an awesome thing. I did have somebody at a different big box store tell me how wonderful they were. Okay, so if you're ready to certify, you've got food, you've got water, you've got cover, you've got places to raise young, you've got sustainable gardening practice practices, and all you have to do is go to this website and you can certify. I want to up the ante here and tell you how easy this is. So I have a hard copy application here. Um, you can go online and do this and it's a point and click exercise, but I keep some of these around because sometimes people don't, don't go online. So here is the list of food sources and they ask you to have a minimum of three, but here's the list. Seeds, berries, nectar, nuts, fruit, sap, pollen, foliage, twigs, seed, butterfly food, suet, hummingbird food, and squirrel food. Is that a hardship to get three from that list? Everybody would have more than three, I bet. And then water sources, bird bath, a shallow dish, a lake, a stream, a river, a seasonal pool, a water garden, a pond, a butterfly puddling area, a rain garden, a spring, or an ocean. <laughs> Again, and you only need one of those. Um, with places for cover, a wooded area, bramble patch, ground cover, rock pile or wall, cave, roosting box, dense shrubs or a thicket, evergreens, a brush or log pile, a burrow, a me meadow, a prairie, a water garden or a pond. And again, no brainer. Um, places to raise young, trees, uh, meadow, prairie, nesting box, wetland, host plants for caterpillars, dead trees or snags, shrubs or thicket, garden pond or, or water garden, uh, burrow and cave. And then this is what they're, they're asking for um, to draw people's attention to the sustainable gardening practices. Um, they're asking for at least two of the three categories. So limit water use, collect rainwater, have a rain garden, plant a buffer around bodies of water, zero scape, which is picking plants that use very little water, um, a drip or soaker hose in, for irrigation, mulch or ground cover, reduce or eliminate your lawn, practice integrated pest management, remove ex invasive exotic species. And that is something we should be doing because they will outcompete our native plants. So um, think of things like English ivy. Um, I thought I had a list of these on here and I don't, I don't remember seeing it. Maybe it's a different presentation. Keep cats indoors. My goodness, if you look at the research on this, I think the latest horror story I read is that outdoor cats kill one billion, with a B, songbirds a year. And if most of our bird species are on the decline, that's something that we can control. It's hard to control climate change and global warming, but we can keep cats indoors. Um, using native plants, eliminating chemical pesticides or fertilizers, and creating a compost pile. So again, those are easy, easy things that we can do. Once you check off your boxes on this presentation or this uh, application, you pay a $20 one-time only fee, okay, to National Wildlife Federation, which is a nonprofit, and they will send you a certificate that looks like this, and it will have your name and a number that's unique to your site. So do you remember when I said we were now over 200,000 for the nation? Look at my number, 44,067. I'm very proud of that. And then I always tell people, invest in a sign. Cheapest sign is 30 bucks. And it's this one right here, which is this has the mascot for National Wildlife Federation there. I think this is passive education. So if I put this in my yard and my neighbor's out walking the dog, they say, what is that sign about? 
and I can tell them all about it. And maybe I get a convert, you know, maybe somebody else decides that they're going to do this as well. If you want a fancy sign, they've got fancy ones that are a lot more expensive than 30 bucks, but they will last forever. I still have my metal sign that is more than, it's probably 23 years old now, and it still looks new. All right, and finally, don't forget to enjoy it. Go out and sit in your yard and have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee and listen to what um, is in your yard and look to what is in your yard and enjoy it. All right, there's uh, my contact information in case you need me for anything. Bringing Nature Home by Doug Ptolemy is a good resource and it has a great plant list in the back of it. So that's a really, really good thing. And then here's our um, Charlotte Native Plant Society um, website. And they also have some tremendous files. They have list of invasive plants. They have list of natives. They've got them split into different categories like vines versus ground covers. Um, they've got pictures of them. And it's, it's a really, really good tool. And then um, National Wildlife Federation also has resources on native plants and um, ways of accomplishing, ways of meeting the criteria for creating wildlife habitats. So questions? So before we do questions, I do have a winner for the bird bath feeder. I, I did a little random number generator and you don't know this Karen Busby, but you were number 37 and you win the, the heater. So we've got your address because you registered obviously and you're on the call. So we'll just ship it out to you. And it's, so that, that's really cool. We try to be as efficient as possible with that. So, um, okay, <laughs> we have a question. I'm gonna ask one first. Um, do you have any field guides and or apps for identification purposes that you like better than others? I have an embarrassing number of them, actually. I've had a case of those. <laughs> yeah, because um, when I was taking um, the um, master naturalist training, they, they give you a lot of resources. When we went through the Native Plant Studies program, they also provided a lot of resources. So I still have a lot of the hands-on with the books, but in my phone, I have Merlin, which is a bird ID app. I have the Audubon app. I have... So do you use iNaturalist? That was what I was trying to come up with. Yes, I do. I love that. Yeah. Because it, it can, it, it does plants and animals and insect, er, everything, everything yep. pretty well, actually. Yeah. I yeah. found it to be fairly accurate. Yeah. And, it, and you get to keep all your pictures there. So you have this weird diary of crazy things you've seen in your yard. Yeah. Okay. This is the, a great question. Uh, and everybody's probably asked it before, but there's never a good answer. Um, what plants do deer not like? <laughs> I should yeah. have thrown that in there. I do have it in another presentation. So if you're hungry enough, you'll eat anything, right? And what deer are being squeezed out of their habitat. So they're showing up places that they wouldn't show. I see dozens when I walk on the Greenway and Matthews almost every week. Um, but they do tend to prefer softer plants. So if you've got hostas, for example, that's deer salad, okay? Um, they don't tend to prefer, notice I'm saying not that they won't eat, but don't tend to prefer, I'm hedging my bets here, um, things that have stickers or bristles, okay? That's, that's not a high value for them. Um, again, they will eat it if they're hungry enough. Some weird tricks that you can try, and it may or may not work. Um, you can put human hair around plants that you don't want to be consumed. Um, if you go to a barber shop, a lot of times you can get them there. Um, and then Lowe's, Home Depot, Renfro's Hardware, the source of all good things in Matthews, sells fox and coyote urine. Don't spill it on yourself. <laughs> it's really bad. But I mean, it's, it's letting the deer know that there's a predator nearby. Okay. So it may deter them. You will have to reapply it after the rain, which means you would have spent, you know, $5,000 this spring, or we don't even in spring this winter because all we've had is rain. Um, but it is definitely worth a try, but it does stink. Don't spill it on yourself. 
Yeah. I've given up on hostas. That, that, that just doesn't happen at my house anymore. Yeah. Um, another question. You mentioned two types of milkweed necessary for butterflies. Can you remind us what those were and what do you think of butterfly houses? Okay, so it's, it's uh, for monarch butterflies, one thing that was specific for them. So common milkweed, and it is... Uh, da, 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 is it syriaca? Syriaca, yep, yep. And then the other thing is the butterfly weed, which is Asclepius tuberosa. tuberosa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But again, you want to really look for things that haven't been treated with neonicotinoids because why are you going to poison the, the monarchs that you bring in? So, And I'll tell you too, um, common milkweed gets five to six feet tall. It, it gets really, really big. I had far better results um, last year though with common milkweed. There were there were more butterflies on that than there were on um, on the um, the butterfly weed, which surprised the heck out of me. And I just saw somebody post that human hair can be problematic for baby birds. You're absolutely right. Um, I would guess putting it under plants might make it less likely that the birds will pick it up for nesting material, but that's just a guess. But yes, it can wrap around the legs and cut off the circulation. You're absolutely right about that. Okay. Okay, um, Mary, I see, I see your lips moving, but I don't know what you said. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh lizards. <laughs> well, you know what? Lizards are good. Lizards are great to have. Now, yes, you will have poop on your front porch from lizards, but you know what? Um, Terminex came over to do a, the, an annual thing, and I have them treating my um, my perimeter of my house only if I see a bug, and they only use a chrysanthemum-based product. And we've it's taken us a long time to come to um, a, 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 an understanding there about that. I have a parrot, so I've got to be really careful about things that could could poison the parrot too. So I had them knock on the door one day and they said, do you see what's on your front porch? And I said, yeah. And they said, do you want us to put some stuff down to kill those things? And I said, let's talk this through. What do the lizards eat? Oh, I know, bugs. No, leave my lizards alone. <laughs> so I do see them all around the perimeter of the outside of the house. I don't ever see them on the inside. They hang out on the front porch. Uh, they're in leaf litter and pine straw in the bed. So I'm... I'm Fine with, I've got a ton of blue tongue, blue tail skinks, tons of them. So one of the questions was, um, they've got lizards, probably anoles, they didn't say which kind, um, on their patio and they're, it's a closed, like a screened in patio and the cats kind of hang out there. But of course mm -hmm. the anoles get in there anyway, because they yeah. can get in all kinds of places and they would like to attract them to other places. Is there any way to do that because I think they're everywhere at my house they're yeah everywhere. that's a really good question and I gotta say you've stumped the speaker on that one <laughs> I would do a little bit of research and find out what they like to eat most and if it's something that you can go buy like mealworms maybe I'm just guessing then put mealworms outside away from that that porch and see if that does the trick it's an Don't interesting it. question <laughs> so the um dripper mister thingy that you have over your um, uh, bird bath, where can one buy that and does it require electricity? It does not require electricity. You do have to plug into a splitter on your, oh, I was right, I guess right, yay for me. She says um, mealworms work for the annuls, yay. Okay. Um, so you, you will have a, a splitter, they call it, on your water source. Okay, and you can have the hose on one side and the, um, the, the dripper mister connector on the other, but it doesn't require electricity. Okay. And, and you can get it at get any it. bird store. Bird store. Yeah, see them all over, yeah, a bird store. And if you guys will look on the chat uh, link, uh, someone posted the inaturalist.org link, and that is a great app. Uh, I, I just like to catalog everything, so that's good. And someone also said that they've had luck with begonias with and deer, meaning I, they don't like him. Like yeah, begonias. and that surprised me because they tend. Yeah. Well, there are different types of begonias, right. um, but they tend to be a softer uh, and almost like a succulent. I but so I'm kind of surprised by that. But hey, give it a try and see if it works. They're annuals. They're not invasive. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Um, any suggestions for a ground cover in a small orchard? It's four or five fruit trees. 
uh, that gets true Southern full sun that I assume <laughs> also supports wildlife. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. So, um, hmm. green and gold. Mm -hmm. Would that um, handle the sun, though? You know, I, I, I've seen um, some, some comments in some group that said that it was tolerating sun far better than they thought it would. Mine is out where the dead dogwood tree is <laughs> and it's in the middle of the yard so it's been getting full sun for years um the christmas ferns have kind of out competed it there but um yeah i would i would try that get, get a few plants and see what happens other than that you're gonna have to go to that native plant site and um, look at conditions and ground covers and see what they recommend so, so i will mention uh ncsu has a thing called a plant toolbox so extension has a plant toolbox and if you will go to just type in NCSU plant toolbox and you'll go to the link and you can put in whatever criteria you want to and it will give you one of 400, I mean, 40, 300 plants that they have out there. Great pictures, great information. So that's another good spot. Somebody also posted some deer resistant natives on the chat box too. So yeah, I'm there's some good stuff popping up there on the chat box. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, what is the name of the poison you mentioned? It started with an M. It's in neo oh, neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids, or yeah. if you want to shorten it, you can go neonix. <laughs> yeah, I will say Linton roses. I have um, not had any problem with, not heard any problem. Um, the angel trumpet. Check that out and see if it's invasive. I'm thinking it might be. Um. Someone wants to know if there are any methods for keeping lizards off of the screens and out of my house. And I'm going to say probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so I, here, this is a, a really random fact that I don't know why I know. Um, apparently there are some lizards that people will actually deliberately have inside their house for pest control. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this person must be from Maine originally, and they wanted to know if milkweed seeds germinate well down here. And I think they have to have a cold spell to germinate. They do them. have to have some cold stratification is what that's called. Yeah. So it's a certain number of days. I should know this. Dr. Melichant would be ashamed of me because I can't come up with this. Um, a certain number of days under a certain temperature. And I, I don't remember what that is. Yeah, it's a couple of, of weeks. It's several weeks, depending on yeah. which type. Uh, yeah, it's several weeks. And it needs to be cool and wet. So you put it in a damp paper towel and put it in the refrigerator if you want to yep, do it yourself. You can do that. Um, I just let mine um, fall to the ground. Exactly. <laughs> that. I'm a lazy Much gardener easier. when it comes right down to it. Much easier. Okay, we got okay. We got the mealworms. Um, let's see. Uh, so we got the, the people who love to watch the deer in their yard, and honestly, I begin to believe that that is the best way to be because fighting deer is nearly impossible isn't it yeah. um let's see okay any other questions guys oh sorry okay somebody said they just put the milkweed seed in the refrigerator and it germinated just fine so that's good yeah yeah and when i said uh yeah wet I, I do wonder this year if because we had so much rain, if we'll have le more poor germination because some of those seeds just drowned. My yard is like walking on a sponge and it's been that way for, I would say two months at this point. Yeah, like pudding. I'd say it's like yeah. thick pudding. Yeah. <laughs> um, you'll find a lot of information too on the North Carolina uh, Extension uh, website. There's, mm -hmm. you just got to search for it, but it is there. There's a lot of, of information there too. Uh, oh, make sure that you keep your live mealworms in the refrigerator. Some of make our refrigerators sure are not really for humans anymore, are they? <laughs> make sure they're labeled so your husband doesn't open them, hoping for a snack. A little and special drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, this says, if we had owls last spring and they had an owlet, <laughs> not an outlet, an owlet, would the outlet move into the parent's old hole? Probably not, but you may very well get the same set of parents again this Ooh. year. So Ooh. that would be very cool. Yeah, that would be. Mike, yeah. you all right? What's up? 
Yep. Uh, best time to hang an owl house. I did see that um, yesterday. Yeah, they, they started searching for love nest in oh about December. Really? And they will probably start not. Yeah, they, they they haven't moved in necessarily, but they do start looking. Um, and then I think I'm trying to think what the guy told me that was on the Greenway because he's got a whole timeline of the last several years. I want to say that they laid their eggs um, in April or late March maybe um, and then he they fledged about the end of May beginning of June and we got to watch all that it was really cool it's right out on the greenway he put it up on his garage and they what started kind of hearing, uh, this was a barred owl barred. and that's what yeah it's probably what you're most likely to to get in this area um, if you've got screech owls on your property you guys are maybe out far enough you might have some screech owls we don't hear them in Matthews at all yeah. Um, we do have great horns, but they're not as, as prevalent as the, um, the barred owls are. And just so you know how to identify them, the barred owl has a mnemonic that says, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Who, who? All right. So if you hear that and you will know it sounds exactly like that, mm -hmm. then you've got a barred owl. They will also make a sound that sounds like monkeys um, running amok, being strangled and having sex. And it is kind of like gargling. It's the strangest sound ever. People freak out when they hear that, but yeah. Yeah, that, that is true. Um, Excellent shade plant list that she's just posted there. Okay. So for, um, so for attracting bees and pollinators? Uh, I saw it was, who, who posted that? It was the one up just before this. Really good list. Um, Celandine Poppy, Indian Pinks. I can't think what else was on there. Really good. So that's list. for shade, shade, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, open up your mind to, to having shade gardens. Man, when I started doing that, I got to garden a lot more because two thirds of my backyard's in the shade. So I, I well, and it's so much more garden. comfortable to yeah, garden exactly. in there. You're not in full sun. <laughs> and so this person is saying, don't bother to hang a, an owl box now because of squirrels moving in so um you know you're probably always gonna ha run that risk because yeah. they would use the same type of habitat but yeah. Yeah. what about butterfly magnet plant so you said the coral honeysuckle that definitely is a butterfly magnet plant the indian pink is mm -hmm. um what else Oh gosh, um, Leatrix. Um, did I say a hummingbird? Did I say hummingbird or butterfly? Which you said one? butterfly. Okay, hummingbird. That's what I meant. That's why I was picking so, red things. We know that hummingbirds like red, sometimes orange, maybe a little bit of yellow. They like tube-shaped blossoms, tube and sometimes it's not that obvious that the blossoms are tube-shaped. So if you look at Lobelia cardinalis, cardinal flower, it doesn't look like those. Or or butter uh, bee balm. It looks like a big pinhead uh, cushion, pin cushion, but each individual thing is this tiny little tube shaped red bloom. So um, it's, it's surprising to see how much time they will spend going from one little one to the other. They'll be out there for hours. If you like to take pictures of hummingbirds, put some cardinal flower in your yard because they're going to stay in the area and you're going to have plenty of time to take pictures. And salvia will has that same kind of flower too. And there's yep. loads of, I mean, I've seen hummingbirds on the black and blue salvia and it's not red, right? I know, yeah. Shape. Yeah, I've seen someone on um, uh, plants that they, you know, these are non-union birds, I guess. They don't know the rules. <laughs> but yeah, I've seen that too. Um, okay, let's see. So we, we got some shade bloomers there. Um, we pulled in last night and were greeted by many glowing eyes sleeping in our backyard. There was a, a bunch actually laying down, I guess they mean deer. <laughs> I hope that's what it is. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, is it safe to coat a wild, I mean, uh, an owl house with linseed oil? I have never heard that. Uh, what I have heard is you might want to put hardware cloth on the inside, which helps the babies climb up and, and get out the first yeah. time. And they don't, um, once they fledge, once they leave that box, they don't come back, okay? So it's not like they come back and sleep there at night. When they come out, when they branch, um, they will go back and forth and back and forth for, I don't know, maybe a week um, before they leave. And just in case you don't know, if you find an owl, um, you should leave it alone. Um, just kind of step way back and wait to see if the, the parents are taking care of it because odds are really good they are. 
I participated in a rehousing last year with an owl and um, was horrified to find that these people had had this bird or this yeah for two, three um, weeks, keeping it in their bathroom and um, ordering food online. And sorry, I forgot to miss my house phone. Um, and didn't understand that, well, they didn't care that they were breaking a federal law. So, um, and it's, we can't teach a baby owl to be an owl. We can't teach an owl how to hunt. <laughs> we can't teach an owl how to con consume and rip apart um, icky stuff, you know? <laughs> no, I, so, I don't think I'm gonna be able to teach that. <laughs> exactly, so um, just leave it alone. The, the parents will find it by sound usually and take care of it. So another question, and I love the way she worded this, Michelle Jeffrey said, how do we feel about caladiums? <laughs> so uh, caladiums are, um, they, they're they not invasive. So to me, that's something that makes a nice container plant. Um, you know, they don't even come back most of the time. You might, sometimes people will bring them in and hope for the best, but yeah, I don't, I don't worry about stuff like that. I worry about stuff that's going to just spread everywhere and take over. Speaking of, next question was about removing kudzu from trees safely. Yeah, so um, that might be one of the very few times that I might use Roundup, but I'm going to be so careful. I'm going to cut it and I'm going to do the, the dabbing thing with the sponge immediately. Um, and you might have to do that two or three times before it finally completely dies. Now, if the best thing is to find it when it's small, you know, so walk your property. And if you find English ivy or you find kudzu starting, that's the time to just pull it out manually and not have to, to worry about it going 50 feet up in a tree. Honestly, both of those plants make Japanese honeysuckle look like a, a walk in the park. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Japanese honeysuckle is easy to pull when it comes right down to it. Now, right now, right, right now is a great time to be pulling that stuff. Yeah. Every, be doing right that. now is a great time to pull anything. Exactly. <laughs> it's just so wet. Yeah. Exactly. Somebody mentioned that Eastern Columbine is another part shade, yep. uh, another great part shade native. It's just unfortunately doesn't bloom for very long, but it is gorgeous and everybody loves it. Yep. Um, uh, Okay. I'm this thinking we have some more native hummingbird plant gardeners here. She says that she still got um, hummingbirds around camellias. So that's really interesting. Um, I'm trying to think who's been Taylor Pehoff, I think. P I E P H O F F. He used to be a naturalist with Mecklenburg County. And he has been keeping his own list of overwintering hummingbirds for several years now. And so he would love to come out and document what it is because you know what? Most people aren't seeing the ruby-throated hummingbirds. What they're seeing is the rufous hummingbirds here. Yep. And we've been seeing them for, gosh, I bet about 10 years now. It's not uncommon at all anymore. So and somebody mentioned Virginia bluebells are another uh, great flower in shade. They'll handle really dark shade. Um, I, I'm not positive about this either, but I think those are invasive. So double check. Virginia bluebell? I think so. Um, again, don't, don't take my I think my you might be it. thinking about a different bluebell because this is, a, I, I have trouble having these things grow at all. I oh, think it's a little too warm here. And somebody, Tony says that kudzu has great medicinal properties, and I am sure that it does, but we have about three billion times more of it than we need. You can also eat it. There are all kinds of recipes. Oh, yeah. You can make a jam from it. I have not done these things myself, mind you, but I've read about them. So go out and eat the, the kudzu, please. Eat the sure. kudzu. Last, I think we'll do this as the last question since we're working at, it's about 740 now. Um, yeah, Virginia bluebells are native. Thank you. Um, my columbine seeds will not germinate. Any ideas why? I don't have a heat mat, but my milkweed, butterfly flower, purple comb flower, foxgloves all came up. Do columbines need cold? Not that I've ever heard of. Um, and I mine come back every year. Now I'm trying to think. But do they sell the seed? The beds, I think, I suspect, yeah. And the beds that I have them in don't have a lot of ground cover. So maybe it allows them to make contact with the soil better. That's my guess. 
I did start some from seed several, several years ago now, and they were the very, they were one of the first things that I started and one of the last things that finally came up. So I would say, be patient and it could happen, <laughs> but it was, I was about to throw the whole flat away and here they come and they have very distinctive uh, leaves on them. So, you know, when they pop up, um, this other uh, woman said, just broadcast the seed where you want them. <laughs> They'll come up. So that's <laughs> She, oh, okay. Spanish bluebells are the ones that are in there. Okay. Okay, guys. I think this was very great. And we're going to put this on YouTube, hopefully by the end of the week. So you can just watch it over and over and over again. And um, uh, please stay tuned. We'll have another talk on March the 23rd. And um, we'll talk more about birds then. Oh, lots of thank yous. Woo, that's beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Have a great night. You're welcome. Enjoyed it. Bye. Bye.